If we take a deeper look into the knowledge systems that we have in the forms of Vedas, Puranas, Upanishads, Agama Shastras, or Siddhanta, so on and so forth, there are three very important standards that are incorporated in structuration, articulation, and propagation of these knowledge systems. The first one is factoring in a rhythm into the linguistics, that is through Chanda Shastram, to make it easily memorizable. I spoke at length about this topic in many of my previous documentaries. Moving to the second one, being aphoristic in nature. That is by leveraging a very unique property of Samskritam that allows you to encode complex meanings into the shortest form of the sentences in Samskrit. And coming to the third one, being dialectical. And this is the most beautiful of the all three because one and two need a bit of scholarship into Samskritam. But the third one is being dialectical in a simple storytelling format where characters exchange the ideas or indulge in a conversation, discourse. It's all about storytelling. So stories are a very powerful means of communication in the history of mankind. And that exactly is what is incorporated as a third standard in the Bharatiya knowledge systems. And just to be clear, these are not written somewhere where these are my observations throughout my research. So in this video, we're going to delve deep into the dialectical aspect of it. And nothing comes about Puranas when it comes to being dialectical in any of the knowledge systems. Because Puranas is all about conversations, stories. Yes, there are a lot of mythical stories as well, to say it upfront. But let us try to understand what is in the 18 Puranas as part of this short video, a brief history of the 18 Puranas. Let's get started. Starting with the basics and semantics, it is called as Puranam, not Puran or Purana. Those are the variations in Hindi or any other language, but the real name in Samskritam is Puranam. Next, what is a Puranam? Sargosyatha visargascha vritti rakshamta ranicha vamso vamsanu charitam samstha hetu rapasrayaha dasabhir lakshanair yuktam Puranam tadvido viduhu kechit pancha vidham brahman mahadalpa vyavasthaya these are the words of Sutta Maharshi from Srimad Bhagavatam explaining what are the qualities that a scripture need to have to be called as a Purana. And there are 10 such characteristics, starting with the first one. Sarga, history of the creation of cosmos. Number two, Visarga, history of the creation of life. Number three, Vritti, history of the evolution of life. Number four, Raksha, history of the sustenance of life. Number five, Antarani, History of the time scales. Number six, Vamsa, history of the lineages. Number seven, Vamsanu Charita, history of the dynasties of the kings. Number eight, Samstha, history of the catastrophes. Number nine, Hetu, history of the prime causation. Number ten, Apasrayaha, history of the supreme being. If a scripture has these 10 qualities, which is all about recording the history over these 10 aspects over millions of years in terms of Mahayugas and Kalpa cycles, such a scripture is called as a Purana. I will take the bull by its horns. First question is, are we conflating history with mythology? History is an account of what happened in the past where it can be proved beyond doubt saying that it happened. Whereas mythology, there is a scope for illusion or some sort of things that we don't really comprehend about the past. That is mythology. Are we conflating history and mythology that you and me don't have to debate? The name itself is given categorically in two different ways. Itihasa is given as a name for Sri Ramayana and Mahabharatam, where they are deemed and revered as exact historical accounts. Whereas Puranas are never called as Itihasas. They are called Puranas for a reason, which is meant to be a historical account. But at the same time, there are many elements which are metaphysical or spiritual or scientific. So a long story short, Puranas are a compendium of various ideas and different aspects beyond just the history. But the prime purpose is to document the history. That's the max I can say. I don't want to give a sweeping statement about Puranas or the historical accounts or mythological accounts. It's up to you how you would like to take. The reason I call this a documentary is I want to put forward facts in which they are and it's up to you the way you want to take them. Another basic question is how many Puranas are there? There are 18 of them. Pretty much all of us know it, but where is this coming in from? These slokas are the OG of all the Puranas, the 18 of them, all written by Sri Vedavyasa Maharshi. 
பிராமம் பாத்மம் வைஷ்ணவம் ச சைவம் லைங்கம் ச காருடம் நாரதீயம் பகவதம் ஆக்னேயம் ஸ்காந்த சங்கீதம் பவிஷ்யம் பிரம்ம வைவர்த்தம் மார்க்கண்டேயம் ச வாமனம் வாராகம் மஸ்தியம் கூர்மம் ச பிரம்மாண்டாக்கியம் இது திரிசத் read the last word of this shlokam it says trishat trishat means 3 times 6 that is 18 are the puranas and they are brahma puranam padma puranam vaishnava puranam saiva puranam linga puranam garuda narada bhagavata agni skanda bhavishya brahma vaivarta markandeya vamana varaha masya kurma puranam and brahmanda puranam these are the 18 puranas and let's try and see in the next couple of minutes what is there in each of these puranas Before we get started I want to say something each of these puranas have thousands of shlokas in some hundreds of chapters it has couple of books it's not just one book every purana has at least 6 to 7 books in some cases 10 15 as well so it's a collection of lot of books thousands of shlokas and hundreds of chapters and what I'm going to present as a synopsis of each purana is just my observation which I hand pick to be sensibly and reasonably representing the essence of the entire purana it is not complete for obvious reasons it's a notion but I tried my best just to present a very high level synopsis of each of these puranas for all the 18 starting with the first one brahma purana brahma puranam details about the sequence of manvantaras and the events that have happened in those manvantaras a manvantara is a very large scale unit of time measurement in bharat which spans across millions of years and there are 14 such manvantaras which are cyclical in nature and brahma puranam details about the sequence of this manvantaras and the events happened in those manvantaras brahma puranam speaks at length about surya vamsam the emperors and the kings and the kingdoms that emanated out of the surya vamsam brahma puranam details about the geography of the ancient world its territorial composition and continents it talks at length about jambu dwipam which is roughly equivalent to the southern half of the asia and europe together largely inheriting from the vedic philosophies brahma puranam establishes the principles and practice of yoga brahma puranam also deliberates about the philosophy of sankhya yoga that was established by kapila maharshi which tries to understand the fabric of this universe and cosmos in a very rational way and most importantly in an atheistic manner to emphasize a bit more on sankhya yogam if one tries to read and understand sankhya yogam you'll get a picture of how open minded is the culture of bharat brahma puranam also gives the account of shiva parvati kalyanam the destruction of daksha yagnam shri krishna's life history brahma puranam also details at extensive length about the shraddha karma and other sacred rites to the pitru devas or the departed ancestors and finally brahma puranam also gives a lot of prophecies and predictions about how kali yugam would unfold this in short is all about brahma puranam the first of all the 18 Number 2 Padma Purana Padma Purana explains about the birth of Lakshmi Devi and many other akhyanas about Lakshmi Devi Padma Purana again details about the destruction of Daksha Yagnam lineages of devas and danavas and very interestingly Padma Purana explains at length about Sri Ramayana it can be divided into two parts one is the missing chapters of sri ramayana the six kandas of sri ramayana what we have from bala kanda till yuddha kanda it is pretty much in a very linear timeline the events are explained in a very linear format as the time progresses but not everything is documented in these six kandas certain chapters or certain events that happened during this linear timeline of bala kanda to yuddha kanda are documented in padma puranam which you will not find in sri ramayana For example Sri Rama meeting Markandeya Maharshi such kind of events are not elaborated in Sri Ramayana of Valmiki but are elaborated in the Padma Purana written by Vyasa Maharshi and then the most interesting part about Sri Ramayana is the Uttara Ramayana so Padma Purana also elaborates at length about the events of Uttara Ramayana as well this i presented at great detail in my documentary on Uttara Ramayana Uttara Ramayana is very much an integral part of the entire Ramayana and Padma Purana reinforces just that so uttara ramayana is explained at great detail in padma purana padma purana also elaborates about various pilgrimage sites across bharat mountains rivers and oceans on the earth the wars of devas and asuras after life journey of the atma or the departed soul significance of each ekadashi is elaborated at length in padma purana so this in short is all about what is in padma purana Number 3 Vishnu Purana Vishnu Purana details about time division and measurement from as small as micro nanosecond level measurement up until millions of years 
wrapped up in the time units of kalpas and mahayugas vishnu puranam mathematically defines the smallest unit of the time up until the largest one for time division and time measurement vishnu puranam also talks at length about the lineages of kings of bharata varsha it also details about the future or the forthcoming manus and manvantaras it explains the structuration of all the four vedas and the composition and contents of the vedas why they are divided in the way they are today rig yajur sama and adharvana vedas it explains about the structure contents and the composition vishnu puranam also elaborates about the 28 vyasa maharshis that we have till now who in each dwapar yuga constituted the vedas and many other knowledge systems and passed down towards their shishya parampara vishnu puranam also elaborates about the sacred rituals that a grihastha should observe it continues to illustrate about various dynasties like puru kuru turvasu and many more it also talks about the legend of prahlad the legend of dhruva 12 adityas and significance of each aditya for each of the month of the year vishnu puranam also talks about how buddha came down as an avatar of vishnu with the positive intention of opposing vedas and vishnu puranam also says that buddha avatar happened not just once but couple of times in a cyclical manner it also talks in great detail about the life history of sri krishna various sacred rituals in the worship of sri mahavishnu it also talks about the history of badrinath and many other important places across bharat that in short is all about vishnu puranam before i move on let me touch on a very important subject sri mahavishnu coming down in the avatar of buddha to oppose vedas in vishnu puranam buddha is not portrayed in any negative manner he is very much revered respected and portrayed as an avatar of sri mahavishnu which came down with a positive intention and a very good purpose to oppose vedas in a certain context we'll not get into that space but what i want to tell you is if opposition of vedas is deemed as a negative aspect then naturally anyone who opposes vedas will also be seen in a negative light but that is not the case here sri mahavishnu who came down in the avatar of buddha to oppose vedas is revered and respected how do you reconcile these two for that one has to do a deep reading into the scriptures and maybe if time permits i will try to do a bit more detailed documentary on buddha alone but the point what i'm trying to say is don't fall into the trap of these religious and political jokers who say that buddhism is opposed by hinduism and it is the brahmanical hegemony which did so and all this nonsense these jokers would have never read the scriptures and their views are loaded with bias and motivation period if you want to know the truth read for yourself the similarities or the history of buddhism and sanatana dharma they are so very intertwined and complement each other number 4 shiva puranam Shiva Purana illustrates the origins of Shiva in the form of Agni Stambham in the conflict between Sri Mahavishnu and Brahma it talks about the sacred rituals of Shiva Lingam it talks about the Shiva Tattvam the philosophy of Shiva it again elaborates about the description of Jambu Dwipam and many other geographical locations in Bharat and around Bharat it talks about Shiva and Sati Devi Kalyanam destruction of Daksha Yagnam Shiva and Parvati Kalyanam the human anatomy and embryology what is the anatomy of a human body and how the embryo gets developed month on month in the womb of a mother a very detailed biological and embryological account of the development of human fetus is illustrated in shiva mahapuranam shiva puranam also elaborates on the birth of kartikeya the birth of ganesha the origins of kala bhairava the origins of 12 jyotirlingas and the birth of nandishwara this in short is all about the contents of shiva puranam Number 5 Bhagavata Puranam it is also called as Srimad Bhagavatam Bhagavata Puranam starts where Mahabharatam ends it elaborates about the end of Mahabharatam and its aftermath it talks about the history of Parikshit Maharaj start of Kali Yugam and how it would unfold Bhagavata Puranam also elaborates the account of the conversation between Uddhava and Vidura before their final departure Bhagavata Puranam also gives us the account of the legend of Varaha Avataram the legend of Kardama Prajapati and his progeny the mythical geography of the world Jambu Dwipam and the seven continents the legend of Narasimha Swami the legend of Kshira Sagara Madhanam complete story of Sri Ramayanam yes you heard that right the complete Sri Ramayanam is elaborated in Bhagavata Puranam as well the legend of Parashurama and the complete life history of Sri Krishna these are the contents of Bhagavata Puranam 
Up next and number 6 Narada Puranam Narada Puranam elaborates about the structure and duties of Varna Ashrama Dharma This is very important instead of reading half educated literatures from politicians or religious people or what not if you want to understand how the Varna Ashrama Dharma was structured I would suggest you to turn to authentic scriptures like Narada Puranam Having said that to be very clear Varna Ashrama Dharma is a socio economic governance structure in the ancient Bharat it may or may not apply in today's world if you want to learn vedas no one's stopping you don't take this half educated statements of brahmanical hegemony or anything of that sort it all depends on what interest you have to learn the truth so i suggest and i repeat instead of reading the half educated literatures from politicians and other religiously motivated people if you want to understand how varnashrama dharma was actually structured i would suggest you to turn to this ancient authentic scriptures not with an intention to observe that today but just to understand how it was structured back then next narada puranam also elaborates about the legend of markandeya maharshi it elaborates the significance of river ganga the legend of vaman avataram the legend of yama dharma raja and also elaborates about the sacred rituals of shraddha karma towards the pitru devas or the departed ancestors Up next and number 7 Markandeya Puranam. Markandeya Puranam is the most detailed of all the 18 on Varnashrama Dharma, even more than Narada Puranam. It has thousands of shlokas elaborating on Varnashrama Dharma. So like I just said, this is also a very important ancient scripture should you be interested to understand the Varnashrama Dharma. It also elaborates about the forms of marriage and the rituals, the human relationships, how to cultivate and nurture human relationships, what types of vegetarian food and what types of non vegetarian food is permitted for different ashramas is elaborated in markandeya puranam yes you heard that right markandeya puranam elaborates about what types of non vegetarian food is permitted for what kinds of people when i am saying kinds of people i am referring to the varnashrama structure sanatana dharma is not a monolithic rock it is a flower that has 1000 petals with each petal of different color and the reason i say that is because of the misconception that we have about non vegetarian food it is permitted for certain kind of people under certain context moving next worship of adi shakti is also elaborated in markandi pur the legends of dattatreya the legend of agni deva the legends of vishnu and brahma the philosophy of yoga the higher spiritual practices in yoga dangers of mishandling yoga this is very important pranayamena yuktena sarvaroga kshayo bhavet ayukta abhyasa yogena sarvarogasya sambhavah this is what hatha yoga pradipika says about yoga for instance if you take pranayama if you perform it under the good guidance of a well learned teacher then it can cure a lot of diseases but if you practice yoga or pranayama yama without having proper knowledge it can bring in new diseases this is what the shloka that i just said establishes so markandeya puranam also elaborates about the dangers of mishandling yoga today it has become a fashion that everybody is a yoga teacher they are just mushrooming everywhere markandeya puranam elaborates about the dangers of practicing yoga under misguidance and finally markandeya puranam also illustrates the life of a typical yogi that in short is all about मारखंडेय पुराणम Up next number 8 is Agni Puranam. It elaborates the legend of Matsya Avataram, Varaha Avataram, Kurma Avataram. It also elaborates about the history of Sri Rama, the history of Sri Krishna, Mahabharatam in brief, the sacred rituals in the worship of Sri Mahavishnu, the temple architecture and engineering, how to construct temples. what kind of architecture needs to be employed for what kinds of temples is elaborated in agni puranam consecration of the murti prana pratishta in the temples ayurvedic plants and their medicinal benefits is also elaborated at great detail in agni puranam and then planetary significances and astronomy state craft and public administration what kinds of policies the king should incorporate to protect his subjects in the kingdom the talks a lot about public administration agni puranam also elaborates about archery weapons martial arts strategies of warfare lineages of many ancient kings and dynasties it talks about chanda shastram and natya shastram as well and finally it also talks about the varnashrama dharma structure that in short are the contents of agni puranam
Up next, number nine is Bhavishya Puranam. Bhavishya Puranam, as the name suggests, it's all about the prophecies of the future, mostly. However, in summary, Bhavishya Puranam talks about the sacred rites for the dead and the departed. It talks about the worship of Aditya or Surya. Vyasa Maharshi, through Bhavishya Puranam, prophesizes that in Kali Yugam, there will be emergence of Malaysia and Pashanda cults, which will create havoc around the world and how they will unleash death and destruction and inflict suffering suffering on the people and in bhavishya puranam it is also elaborated about the various kings and dynasties that would be coming in future that in short is about bhavishya puranam up next in number 10 is brahma vaivarta puranam this puranam extensively focuses on sri krishna and radha devi it elaborates at extensive length about the legend of Radha and Krishna, the esoteric philosophy of Radha Krishna, significance of cows, origin of the creation, origin of the Manus and his progeny, various Prajapatis and their progeny, the worship of Saraswati, Lakshmi and many other gods and goddesses, the punishments of Atma post-death, the discourse of Yamadharma Raja, complete history of Sri Krishna and how Dwaraka got submerged in the ocean. These are the important aspects that Brahma Vaivartha Puranam elaborates. Up next, number 11 is Linga Puranam. Linga Puranam elaborates about the genesis of creation, the esoteric philosophies of Shiva. This is very important. The entire Shiva Tattvam is very much condensed and concentrated in Linga Puranam, the esoteric philosophies of Shiva. The origins of Aghora, the origins and philosophy of Aghora is detailed in Linga Puranam. Then comes the origins of Namdi, geography of the ancient world, geography of Bharat and geography of Jambudvipam, the eight forms of Shiva, the science of music. This is very important. The science of music, the reason I use the word sciences in Linga Puranam, it is explained at great detail as to how each music note is positioned the way it is. What sort of experience each frequency and each note will invoke in a human when we listen to that specific note. It is mind-blowing the way it is articulated and anyone of you who has interest in music, I would really recommend go through Linga Puranam, this aspect where it elaborates the Sangeeta Shastram in a very scientific manner. And then Linga Puranam also elaborates about the sacred rituals and Dana Dharmas, the solar system and influence of sun on other planets, enumeration of various Shiva Lingas across Bharat. This in short is all about Linga Puranam. Up next, number 12 is Varaha Puranam. Varaha Puranam elaborates about the origins of Ashwini Devas, origins of Durga, origins of Dharma, geography of Jambudvipam again, and the origins of the mythical mountain of Meru, geography of Kraunchadvipam, geography of Shakadvipam and geography of Kushadvipam. The Kraunchya, Shaka, Kushadvipas, these are the continents which roughly talk about America, Africa, parts of Europe and Asia as well. Before jumping to any conclusions or assuming anything wild, what I would suggest is we need to read the scriptures to understand what was the worldview of people back then. It may match to what it is today or may not, but the least that we should be doing is read it and then form an opinion. Varaha Puranam elaborates on the geographical composition of various continents. It calls them with different names, like I just said, Kraunchadvipam, Shakadvipam, Kushadvipam, so on and so forth. And we are living in Jambudvipam. That's where India is situated. Jambudvipam. Moving on. Varaha Puranam also elaborates about the legend of Mastyavataram. Varaha Puranam elaborates Agastya Gita. Just like how Bhagavad Gita is narrated by Sri Krishna, there is a compendium of life lessons elaborated by Agastya Maharshi and is called as Agastya Gita. And Agastya Gita is an integral part of Varaha Puranam. And then we have Rudra Gita as well, narrated by Lord Shiva. Rudra Gita is also a compendium of philosophies and life lessons given down by Lord Shiva and an integral part of Varaha Puranam. Varaha Puranam also gives enumeration of various Tirthakshetras or pilgrimage sites across Bharat and it also details about various sacred rituals. And that, in short, is the synopsis of Varaha Puranam. Up next, number 13, Skanda Puranam. It is the largest of all the 18 Puranas and I cannot emphasize enough the importance of Skanda Puranam. It is so huge 
so wide, so deep and so complex. It has thousands of chapters. It has more than 1 lakh shlokas. In terms of its volume, it is 4 times bigger than Sri Ramayanam. What you are seeing here is not even 0.001% of Skanda Puranam. Nonetheless, I tried to articulate my best. So it talks about the history of Kedhar Nad, Tirupati, Puri, Ujjain, Badrinad, Ayodhya, Prabhasakshetra, Dwaraka, Varanasi, enumeration of various Tirdhas in Bharat, and the history of Arunachalam. You name it, almost every sacred place in Bharat has a place in Skanda Purana. Almost every festival that we celebrate has a reference from Skanda Purana. It's huge. I rest my case. Let's move forward. Up next, number 14 is Vamana Puranam. It talks about the destruction of Daksha Yajnam. Let me take a quick sidestep. Daksha Yajnam is a very important event that led to emergence of the 18 Shakti Pitas, the shift of Agastya Maharshi to the south of Vindhyas, thus establishing the Tamil culture and language. So there are many important events tied up to Daksha Yajnam. And that is the reason it is elaborated so many times in so many Puranas. So let's move forward. So, Vamana Puranam also talks about the geography of Jambudvipam, Bharatavarsham and a lot more. It talks about the legend of Naranarayana in Badrinath, the legend of Saraswati River, Shiva and Umakalyanam, birth of Kartikeya, the legend of Bali Chakravarti. For those of you who are from Kerala and you celebrate Onam, the foundational text is essentially Vamana Puranam that elaborates the legend of Bali Chakravarti. And also, as the name goes, it also explains about the legend of Vamana Avataram. That, in short, is all about Vamana Purana. Up next, number 15 is Garuda Purana. Now, before I move any forward, I'm sure you would have watched the movie Anyan Raparichitudu or Aparichit, in which the movie is kind of centrally based on the theme of Garuda Purana, talking about hell and punishments and whatnot. Just come out of that for a minute and let's try to understand what are the real contents of Garuda Purana. Garuda Purana elaborates about the legend of Hayagriva, an avatar of Vishnu, who's the bestower of all the great supreme knowledge. And then it elaborates at extensive detail. I think I have to repeat the word extensive detail at least two or three times. At that detail about formulating antidotes for different kinds of poisons. My God, you will just go mad if you start reading Garuda Puranam. The amount of shlokas that are dedicated to deal with different kinds of poisons and how you formulate antidotes for each and every kind of poison is just mind-blowing. It talks at extensive length about different kinds of poisons and how to formulate antidotes for different kinds of poisons. That's what Garuda Puranam talks about. It explains the philosophy of Vastu. It explains the architecture and engineering of temples. And then it also deals about gemology. That is how to test a gem for its purity. It could be diamond, emerald, sapphire, ruby, whatever the precious stone is. For each and every precious stone, how should you perform the purity test to tell whether the gem is of good quality or not. All that is detailed in Garuda Purana. And then we have rituals for atonement or prayaschitta for different kinds of sins is elaborated in Garuda Puranam and then sacred rituals of Adi Shakti, Shiva, Vishnu, diagnosis of different kinds of ailments, Ayurvedic practices and formulation of medicines for different kinds of diseases. The philosophy and practice of yoga is also elaborated in Garuda Puranam. And then comes the topic that we all are familiar about Garuda Puranam. There is a section in this scripture called as Preta Khandam in which the punishments that the Atma will be receiving in the hell based on his or her karma of the past life. And it elaborates different kinds of punishments for different kinds of sins that one's soul or Atma has to undergo in the hell. That is just one part of Garuda Purana. It also elaborates about the complete story of Sri Ramayanam and the complete story of Mahabharatam as well. So that in short is all about Garuda Puranam. There are a lot of conceptions about Garuda Puranam that it should not be read by everybody or it should not be read under normal circumstances, so on and so forth. I don't have any scholarly authority to comment on that. But one thing I can say for sure is during the COVID, when Bharat has been distributing the vaccines under the Vaccine Maitri program, every COVID vaccination box had the Sanskritam lines printed on it. It calls Sarvesam Tuniramaya. That means may we all live a healthy life together. 
and those words sarve santuni ramaya is picked up from garuda purana it is meant for everybody that's just a positive note i want to share about garuda puranam with all of you up next number 16 kurma puranam kurma puranam elaborates ishvara gita again a compendium of philosophies and life lessons given by mahadev and ishvara gita is a part of kurma puranam and kurma puranam also elaborates on digression of time the time division and computation It talks about the legend of varaha avataram parvati sahasra nama the legends of shiva ganas the conversation between krishna and shiva the legend of various shivalingas across bharat the geography and astronomy details of all the events across different manvantaras the legend of 28 vyasa maharshis again in this puranam the 28 vyasa maharshis are quoted and explained for their works and then the legend of namdeshwara this in short is all about the contents of kurma purana up next number 17 mastya purana there is a very special trait for mastya purana it talks about the lineages of surya chandra yadava kosala maurya sunga and many other dynasties in a very linear format as to who inherited from whom the bloodline is not broken it is continuously narrated like who came from whom in this entire chain of dynasties that's a very special quality of mastya purana which is rarely found in any other puranas and then again it details about the sacred rituals for the worship of vishnu shiva adi shakti etc it talks about state craft polity and public administration how should a king treat his subjects so on and so forth it talks about the architecture and engineering behind the temples and forts and other public living spaces it talks about the geography of ancient world and finally the last one the 18th puranam brahmanda puranam it talks about different kalpas manvantaras and other time divisions it talks about the genesis of creation geography of the world and bharat the legends of the saptarishis the seven celestial sages and the legends of each of the saptarishis and then brahmanda puranam also enumerates all the punya tirthas or the pilgrimage sites across bharat and then sacred rituals to the pitru devas the legend of parashurama the legend of manu and his progeny the legend of river ganga the legends of various prajapatis and their progeny and again just like linga puranam brahmanda puranam also gives the scientific elucidation of sangeetam how the pitch and frequency of each musical note will create a specific emotional impact is elaborated in great detail in brahmanda purana and then comes the explanation about the dynasty of ikshvaku the dynasty of vrishni and then the last but the one which has highest spiritual significance lalita sahastra namam is an integral part of brahmanda purana sri veda vyasa maharshi encoded 1000 names of adi shakti in the form of lalita sahastra namam and made it an integral part of brahmanda purana that is a very quick and synoptical view about the 18 puranas authored by sri veda vyasa maharshi it will take a lifetime for one to really read through this 18 huge great grand scriptures that are compendiums of various aspects of science philosophy art music and what not i just want to share one of my experiences with you which is very important let me just do that couple of months ago i did a documentary on this channel called as the human anatomy as given in shiva puranam i was really baffled when i came across shiva puranam for the first time on this subject month by month how a human embryo or the fetus gets developed in the womb of a mother is elaborated in shiva puranam at great detail which exactly concurs with the modern day understanding of how the development of fetus happens in a mother's womb it is exactly the same almost i did a word by word slokam by slokam translation in the documentary if you're interested go and check else i just want to keep the message short here what is the genesis of human life in the mother's womb is elaborated in shiva purana it talks about the umbilical cord it talks about the embryonic skin it talks about the placenta it also talks about how many bones and muscles the fetus would develop over month on month in the mother's womb all this is an integral part of shiva purana written by veda vyasa maharshi the foundations of the modern day understanding about how the fetus gets developed in the mother's womb over a period of time goes back into history at max at around 1500s that's when leonardo da vinci started drawing the human 
anatomy, how it would look like. And over the last 600 years or so, we got evolved to the state where we are. But the oldest known manuscript, I repeat the word, the oldest known manuscript of the Shiva Puranam itself dates more than a thousand years. And Shiva Puranam is many, many thousands of years old, which elucidates the development of human fetus. I was really baffled when I studied this for the first time. Starting from the mala, which is like the human excretion, it goes up the levels of from Malamutra to Nadi Vyavastha to the flows of Prana and Rasa, Sharira Dhatus, Garbhadharana, Garbha Parivruddhi, Garbhastha Narakam and finally Shiva Jnanam. So it is a totally an intertwined concept of biology and philosophy both in the line of Shiva Jnanam. That's what is Shiva Puranam saying about the human aspect as well as the philosophical aspect or the spiritual aspect. And not just Shiva Puranam, there is also another Upanishad, part of Adharvana Vedam called as Garbha Upanishad. And this Upanishad also talks about the development of fetus month on month and this was authored by Maharshi Pippalada. And Garbha Upanishad is part of Vedas that is much higher than the Puranic references. Back in 1920, that's approximately more than 100 years ago, Paul Jusen, a German German scholar did research on the Upanishads that we have in Bharat and he explicitly wrote at length about Garbha Upanishad where it talks about the development of fetus in the mother's womb and in more scientific terms about the embryology. Now to summarize what I want to tell is we have the knowledge systems that are really beyond comprehension of human intelligence. You don't have to over romanticize every ancient scripture and forcefully find scientific elements in each and every scripture. Neither you should ignore saying that all this is trash or mythology. Both are extreme stances. I want to urge all my viewers to take a balanced approach and really discover the treasure of knowledge what we have in Bharat and what we have been inheriting from the great rishis and sages over the past hundreds of years or rather thousands of years. So that's about the 18 Puranas in brief about its content, structure, composition and most importantly the essence. I hope the younger generations of Bharat develop an unbiased worldview and an inquisitive learning approach towards the ancient knowledge systems of Bharat, which unequivocally establishes why Bharat has been called as a Veda Bhumi, the land of knowledge, and most importantly, how we put that knowledge for the betterment of humanity. That is what Puranas teach us. And as always, thanks for watching.